It's easy to become overwhelmed when you look at the sheer number of electric bikes that are out there. So let's start with some basics. E-bikes are bicycles with a battery powered assist that comes when you pedal, or in some cases use the throttle. Pushing the pedals engages a small motor, which gives you a boost so you can zip up hills and cruise over rough terrain without breaking a sweat. Twisting a throttle does the same with no pedaling necessary. Primarily for regulatory reasons, electric bikes are also divided into classes that denote their level of motor assistance. Figuring out which class of e-bike you need is a key decision point. Most new riders start out with a class 1 e-bike. Class 1 bikes are the most affordable and from a regulatory standpoint, the most universally accepted. You can ride one on city streets and many bike paths, although access is not universal so always check first. Class 2 e-bikes are typically allowed in the same places as Class 1 e-bikes. That's because both classes top out at 20 miles per hour for motor assistance. Class 3 e-bikes are popular with commuters and errand runners. Compared to Class 1 bikes, they're faster and more powerful, and of course cost more. The payoff with added performance is that you can keep up with traffic better. They also climb better and handle heavier loads. So one of the most important things to consider is how do you plan to use the bike? for commuting, off-roading, touring. The distance an e-bike will go on one charge the battery is called range. It's like the gas tank in your car. It's probably the most important specification. If your commute involves a big hill, for example, you don't want to run out of juice halfway up. Without power, an e-bike is just a heavy bike. The range depends on the battery capacity, the speed, your weight, profile of the commuting tour, the assistance level you choose, and the percentage of given pedaling power. If you're only going to do 10 miles of daily commuting, you don't need a 70 mile range. Nevertheless, you should buy a bike with a higher range than you necessarily need, because the range will drop as the battery ages and loses capacity. As I just mentioned, where and how you ride plays a role in your battery life. So here's a list of the factors that will affect your battery life. Basically, anything that makes it more challenging to ride a standard bike can have an effect on battery life. So you also need to consider details like proper tire inflation. Now let's talk about motors. There are two main motor types, mid-drive motors with the motor positioned in the middle of the bike, usually between the pedals, and hub-drive motors, which are located in the center of either the front or rear wheel, which is usually the rear. There are pros and cons to both. Hub drives have been around forever and tend to be cheaper and more versatile. They're excellent motors for anyone needing a reliable e-bike for long, mostly flat commuting. Mid drives are usually smaller and lighter and can allow for greater torque than hub drives, making them particularly well suited for hilly areas and off-road use. The centered position on the bike also creates a more balanced ride and changing a tire on a mid drive bike is usually less of a pain. Now let's talk about price. Interestingly, one of the biggest differentiators in e-bike quality isn't the electric components, but rather the bicycle components. Most e-bikes use similar electrical components until you reach the mid-range price level, at which point the bikes begin to feature nicer quality electrical components. A mid-range electric bike will run between $1,000 and $2,500. This is the sweet spot where both the electric and the bike components improve drastically. Whereas budget level e-bikes are good for those that want to experiment with the concept of e-bikes, this mid-range category is for those that are committed and want a decent e-bike without paying used car prices. Once e-bikes surpass $1,000, components like brakes and shifters start transitioning into better models, tires start coming with recognizable names, and frames start feeling like something you could ride down a set of stairs without breaking it in half. Your e-bike, of course, is more than just its motor and battery. Here are more details to consider when comparing e-bikes. The more performance-oriented the bike, the smoother and more responsive its pedal assist will feel. Most bikes offer three or four assist levels, allowing you to preserve battery power in eco mode or summon more speed and torque in turbo or boost mode. We had a throttle added to my bike. I use it to help get me going when I have to cross an intersection and maybe need a short burst of extra juice going up a hill or getting me out of a sticky situation. We were so happy we got shocks on our bikes. While they're great on rough terrain, they're equally handy when riding over 20 miles per hour on roads where you can find road debris and potholes. Found most often on city and commuter bikes, headlights and taillights are a nice safety feature to have. Systems vary with high-end bikes having more powerful lighting. Ours automatically go on when the bike senses darkness. Fenders can come in handy when you're riding on wet trails and you want to stay dry. Or just keep the mud slick off your back. 
There's a lot going on with an e-bike, so it's helpful to have a handlebar mounted bike computer that lets you monitor battery life, pedal assist mode, miles ridden, speed, and more. This is probably the one thing we don't like about our bikes. The rear rack is so narrow you can't really use it for anything. Luckily, we could put a post mounted rack on. Don't forget to consider the weight of the bike. Heavier bikes are hard to lift. Are you going to have to carry it up the stairs to your apartment? Some e-bikes are too heavy for traditional racks like those on the front of buses and might even be too heavy for your car's roof-mounted bike rack. One way to reduce weight during transport is to remove the battery. We lost the battery coming home from our very first ride and they cost a fortune to replace so you may want to remove it regardless. You also want to make sure you have somebody nearby who can repair your bike. We were lucky that when my bike was throwing its chain, we could take it to a nearby dealer and get it fixed almost immediately. Probably the most important thing about buying an e-bike is make sure the bike you buy is the best bike for you and one that truly fits you. When you make an investment as big as an e-bike, it's important to make sure the bike feels like it was made for you or it can at least be modified to fit you with a few smart part swaps before you ride it out the door. So find a bike shop that'll allow you to test the bike you want. In many large cities, electric bike shops will offer daily rentals. We spent $75 a piece to rent bikes for a day, and it was definitely worth it. But we also negotiated to have the $75 taken off the cost of a bike if we purchased from them. Take your time, one spin around the parking lot isn't enough. And by the way, we didn't buy the bikes that we'd rented for the day. It got us to test other bikes in their showroom, and we found something that was a better fit for us. We hope you found this helpful. We'll see you on the trail.